Hello, my name is Cam Johal and welcome to the show. Today we are in the esteemed company of a dear friend of mine who's an international motivational speaker. She's been awarded an OBE. She's an entrepreneur in her own right who's had many, many successful businesses. I'd like to welcome my good friend Kavita O'Broy to the show. Welcome Kavita. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good, good. Thank you for having us at your wonderful house. Absolutely beautiful. So tell me, where did it all begin for you? Where did it all begin? Well, I think for me, it began probably at the age of two. Wow. So people say, um, are entrepreneurs born or um, is it in the genes or can you become an entrepreneur? And for me, it was certainly in the genes. Okay. So my father came to the UK in the 1960s mm -hmm. to make his fortune and his sole focus was to set up a business. And um, he came over here and uh, he watched uh, somebody plumb a bath and he decided he was going to set up a plumbing business. Oh, wow. He was never going to do any of the handiwork. It was all a mastermind in the head. He called over his brother who did a lot of the handiwork and he did. He set up a very, very successful business, which is now third generation. Wow. Where was that? Um, so that was in Yorkshire in Bradford. Okay. So I was born in Bradford and I remember when I born... I was born above a shop, um, which was the first retail outlet. And um, so every day I used to go downstairs. I had like, very early lessons and I used to go out with my father every uh, Whenever I used to go out, my mum used to give me a little bottle, dress me in the best dress. And I've got great memories of going out with my father. And I remember in those days, he used to leave me in the car for hours and then while he went to have his meetings, <laughs> he'd never do that now. Um, and, uh, so, you know, so my, my training really started early um, at that age. Um, so, yeah, so for me, it, it was in the genes. Wow. So before you started school? Yeah. Your father used to take you out? Yeah. So what you have is you have a lot of subliminal lessons. You don't realize this so it was nothing on purpose it was just how it was happened you know my I had an older sister and an older brother um, and when my father came over here he had to leave them with my mother in India so there's a big gap sure. big gap and then I was like the first child who was born you know when he was able to afford to bring my mum over. I mean, yeah. to come here, he had to sell my mum's jewellery. He worked on the railways. Wow. And so he had to sell her gold to get here. Um, so yeah, and then when I was born, what he said was I was a lucky charm. That's when all the wealth started to come. I mean, you know, I, I, I remember him putting me on his Mercedes at the front, taking photos of me, because um, he said I was, I was the one. And that's when his, his wealth really wow. started to assemble. But you know, I, 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 all of those things have an impact on you and I remember actually um, at a young age going into the shop um, serving customers I, I, I know all about plumbing all okay. the copper fittings everything because wow. uh, I used to like going and serving those things because I could do those things um, and you learn so my lesson started early but um, it, it was sort of a contradiction though because okay. Um, in our family, it was very, very strict, very strict. So men went to work and the place for the woman was in the house. Of course. So, you know, there was all these things that were battling all the time. But those were, that was my early sense of business. And, you know, my father was a, a real inspiration in terms of, you know, um, business. Okay. And obviously my mother, if it wasn't for my mother... You know, she was the one who battled, when I tell you more of my story, empowered me, battled against all the, you know, the taboo of women getting educated, etc. If it wasn't for her, then I wouldn't be here today. Of course. So, was there a contradiction in terms of, so your father thinks that you're the lucky charm, so does he then treat you differently how girls were being treated at that time? Well, I think, obviously, I, I was a, the, the younger one, wasn't I? I was a new yeah. child who'd been born. But then, so as I was growing up, it, it became very evident to me that my um, destiny was going to be very much like that of my, the girls in our family, and I mean extended family, yes. cousins, etc. My older sister, she got married at 19, hardly any education, arranged marriage. So my cousins... They were all getting married very young, um, 
not no education. It wasn't the thing to do. Of Girls not to be educated. And me, I was, I suppose, a bit of a rebel, you know, in, in that I wanted to break every rule. And I think entrepreneurs, that's what they are. They see, break yeah. every rule. These are patterns, aren't they? These are patterns, yeah. yes. So for me, if somebody said you can't do something, I'm going to go and do it. You know, if there's something that I'm not supposed to do, that's, that's, that was me. So, um, you know, and, and a real anguish for learning. Um, and I remember I wanted to go um, learn the piano. I wanted to go and do different things. I just wasn't allowed. No, you're not doing this. You're not doing this. Girls aren't meant to do this. I wanted to go and do ballet and tap dancing. But in the, in, what I was very good at was getting my way. And I did go to ballet lessons and tap lessons, but my mum used to sneak me out of the house. My dad never knew without if he his knew knowledge. Without his knowledge. And then I started getting honours, I started getting all my certificates and everything. And like one day he found out and then, it, you know, it just went, it went mad. But then, you know what, slowly, slowly, slowly those barriers break and things become the norm. And then it becomes acceptable. Sure. Um, so, um, and again, you know, I, I, it, it was just... It was fine as a child, obviously, you know, I was, what I was doing. But then as I was going into teenage, etc., things were like, I knew that it's, it, it, I felt this, this battle. You know, girls are not supposed to go to work. They're not supposed to be educated. And then, unfortunately, at the age of 15, my father died. So that was a really challenging time. What was the cause of that? Um, heart attack um, and, and again I think that was more very much of his lifestyle he was an entrepreneur he built up a very successful business he had a very fast lifestyle you know, the best diet smoking etc mm. um, and what he was only like, probably the age I am now a couple of years older than I am so he died I mean my, mo my mother was about 45 mm -hmm. she had four children because after myself my, my younger brother was born mm -hmm. so there's two girls and two boys okay. my older sister and brother were married yeah. when he died and there was myself and my younger brother so did your siblings all go to university or not? nobody went to university so what happened is when um, I got to f you know my father had died and what I really wanted to do was to have an education mm -hmm. um, and I, I did my GCSEs um, I did my A-levels and I, I remember at the time as well somebody had, had come and, and looked at my books and said to my mum you know she's only ever going to get a B in a chemistry and if anybody ever says to you you can't do something you should take that as motivation it really upset me at the time but I thought you know what I'm going to I'm going to really focus and I'm going to achieve this, drove me. So anything that people said I can't do or she's not good at, that's what drives me. So, and again, you know, if you think about entrepreneurs, challenges drive entrepreneurs. Sure. Challenges make entrepreneurs think even harder to achieve what they want to achieve. So I, 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 I love challenges, you know, mm. we're in COVID now and that's a challenging time, but true entrepreneurs get over those challenges. So, um, I, um, and I did end up, I ended up getting a first class degree in applied chemistry. Okay. In. Do you think you would have been allowed to go to university had your father uh, been around? Probably not. Now the compromise I had to make, I, I didn't, wasn't allowed to go to university as such as leave home travelled every single day. Mm. I went to Huddersfield, we used to live in Bradford, I used to travel every single day back and forth, yeah. so I wasn't allowed to stay away. Yeah. But but you know the other thing, what is important? Compromise. Mm. If you want to achieve anything, you have to compromise. Now for me, that was the compromise. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I really wanted to be a doctor and I was not going to be allowed because it would take six, seven years. And what was the priority? marriage yes, you're gonna be course. too old to get married if you do medicine and you might run off <laughs> so uh, that was never going to be allowed so you know for me I picked chemistry um, but I really felt the pressure I didn't even feel like I was going to finish that degree because every weekend I would be introduced to prospective husbands because education was not the priority no it was getting married so whilst you're at university your family is tr still trying to fix you up yeah Okay. Probably from the about age of 16 that happened. Yeah. But a lot of us lived those kind of dual lives, yes. didn't we? That we, we, whether we went to university or college, yeah. we lived a life there. Yeah. And at home it was very different, wasn't yeah. it? And the kids of today would never, ever no. think how, how on earth did no. we get through those times. But we got through them, like you said, that we compromised and we gave up a little bit. 
and our parents gave up a little bit. Did didn't it? They? Yeah, I think I think there's um, this generation are very uncompromising. <laughs> I think we compromise, and we still compromise. Yeah, um, I think the thing with that is for me is that we have a lot of our culture and our value systems that our parents brought with us. Yes. And of course, we've not always been able to instill that in our children. Yeah. So they're very much the next generation, obviously, as they are. Yeah. So I always think that sometimes we get the worst deal. Yeah. That we have to compromise with our children and our parents. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so. But it is what it is, isn't it? You know, we, we've got fantastic mm. opportunities whilst mm-hmm. we're here. So... You don't get married, I presume, whilst you're uh, still studying? No, I, I didn't. And um, I, my degrees were um, aiming to finish about 20, when I was 22. Um, my mum's having kittens because I'm still not married. And I, I'm now nearly finished my degree, as are my extended family, my brother, the whole, the whole extended family, you know, cousins and everyone. Um, um, and But, you know, I managed to sort of push this out further and then as I'm sort of in my last year my mum just said to me you know we, we had scouted the whole country for prospective husbands and in uh, even flew in planes to go and pe- meet people in boys in Ireland and all sorts wow. all, all pre-arranged um, I hated it absolutely hated every bit of it um, and uh, you know it, it got very frustrating because the family would say what's the problem now what's the problem now and then my mum said, you know, did you not know anybody in a university or whatever? And as you know, you know, they have to meet a certain criteria, it has to be the right background or all of this. Everything is, 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 has to be exactly right, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And I said to my mum, I said, I, I think there is probably one person, but I'm sure he's married now. Um, um, and uh, we just talked about uh, 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 somebody in Derby. And um, my mum said, oh, Derby, oh, you don't want to go to Derby. Um, <laughs> you and then, how old were you then? I was 22. So at the age of 22, yeah. the family is struggling, saying she's going to get left on the shelf. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And look at, the, look at what's going on today. I know. Yeah, I you know. would not dream of, of doing that to your own children, I would know. you? So, uh, and then just out of the blue, somebody rang my mum, who knew... Um, a person in Derby mm-hmm. and knew my family and said we think you know it would be a good match go and see this uh, this boy go and see their family so uh, my mum my papi my brother they all came down to see um, uh, Devon um, and see the family um, and um, you know saw him at the shop Shell told them at the at the business, okay. um, you know, because that's what we do, don't we? We're open all hours, and yeah. uh, that's where they first met uh, Devon. And my mum, I think she stalked out the day until she could come home as well and check out the home. Um, and, uh, you know, came back very excited, like she would do with everybody. She liked everybody anyway. All my family liked everyone. Yeah. Um, and then um, bec- and we actually did n- know each other, knew of each other at university. Yes. Uh, Devon had um, done accountancy and I was doing my degree there. So we did know each other and, he- and I think his father asked him whether he'd, he'd like to meet, you know, prospect- and he said, no, absolutely not. But nobody listened. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, if, he, if, he, if I do um, get married, then uh, he needs to take his tash off of what <laughs> I could remember. Um, so I, I finished my degree, sort of 21, 22, and I, this was going on. And at the same time, I landed my dream job. Okay. I absolutely landed my dream job. So what I wanted, well, I did a degree in chemistry, and I had one year out in ICI, in mm-hmm. the labs. And that year taught me that I do not want to be working in a lab. What I want is I want a company car, I want to be in sales, because um, actually... When I was about 15, 16, that's when I got my first proper job. I mm-hmm. used to work at Richard Shops, okay. selling fashion. Okay. And that's when the whole world went mad. Um, all the extended family went mad. They said, she, you know, she's bringing the name in shame. My father was a successful entrepreneur. What was I doing going out to work? Yeah. Were they objecting to you going to work or working for somebody else? Then? No, going to work. Okay. Um, and uh, it was just going to work. Um, and again, that's when I had my fir- first job. And actually, and that was just after my father had passed away. In fact, some people said my mother had had a breakdown allowing that. Right. But you know what she always said to me? She said, you, uh, never let me down. Yeah. You know what she meant? She said, don't bring the family name, shame. So I owe a lot to my mother. So I always remember, remembered that. So, um, yeah, so what happened is after my mum came to see 
um, Devon, then the week after they were to come and see me. And you have all the typical, wear a heel because he's very tall, you're small, this, that, all of the tip things that normally happens. Um, so when, when he walked in, he didn't have his tash, but he had a sad jumper on. Okay. And I thought, all right, he hasn't got that, but I can change the jumper. So because we knew each other, it was quite easy just to have a conversation. Yeah, so it's more comfortable for you? Yeah, mm. so we're having a conversation, etc. And do you know what I thought in my head? I thought of all the people I've met, and I thought, you know what, he's the best of a bad lot. No, I didn't. But you know what, I, I actually thought, you know, you have to think about everything. Um, you have to make some compromises. Uh, and I just thought, yeah, you know, it, he, he's, he's a slightly different person to me. I knew his past, etc. And then as we were sitting in the room, he said to me, I really need to tell you something because I'd got my job now. I'd got mm -hmm. my first class honours degree. Yeah. He said, my family are really strict. Mm. You will not be able to have a career. Wow. Okay. He says, you're never going to be able to go. To, you can come to our business. You can't, you're not going to be able to work outside the family house. Very traditional. Um, uh, you know, it's about the rupti needs to be on the table, etc. And the other thing is, whilst I was growing up, I, I didn't go in the kitchen and make all the ruttis and everything, but my mum was a fabulous cook, mm -hmm. cooking all the time. So you learn in so many ways. Yeah. So, you know, I learned all my cooking skills subliminally from what was happening in the house. Um, and she, he said, you know, you, this is what is going to be. I want to tell you. He said, but we'll be fine. But I just want to tell you what the compromise is. How did that make you feel? And I went, oh, you know what? It's fine. I really? Said, yeah, I said, it's okay. Because you know what? Now, you can imagine it's probably about six, seven years now. And I've been, and I feel like the pressure is really on. So the pressure to get married, oh, to say yes, is far greater yeah. than your career. Oh, you won't yeah. sacrifice anything. Oh, yeah. And, wow. and you know what? I think sometimes you just got to, and, I, and you know, I could feel this would be fine. But then you have to work hard at it. You have to. And what I thought is, okay, well, if I can prove that I can do everything and I'll do the roti, I'll do the safari, I'll do everything and, and make the roti and then I'll be allowed to hopefully go. I'll, work, I'll win them round. Mm -hmm. And then he also told me something else. He said, um, the other thing is my mum's got breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, she's really quite serious and, you know, the, we're going to have to get married quite quickly, etc. So we were just chatting. So on that day, within an hour, we decided that was it. And that was it. So on that, then everything, all the shagun started. It's all done. That was all done and dusted. Yeah. And that was it. So then six months, then obviously I'd started my job. Um, and um, uh, I, I was, and it was my dream job. I was a medical sales rep. Yeah. I was going in seeing doctors. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be in that field. I had my company car. It was amazing. I loved it. Where were you based? I was doing. I was in Bradford. So okay, I was doing so Yorkshire. Home, yeah. yeah, I was at like home, and then um, I used to know all the doctors were our family friends. It was just what I dreamed of, and then I had to break it to my employer that actually I'm I'm going to get married and um, I'm not going to be able to work. And my trainer at the time went, "There's no way. There's absolutely no way. No, I have to go and see your family. You are, you know really talented." And it's quite important to have mentors and people who can help you to sort of progress on. Of course. Um, you know, so it, it's good to have those other people who can push you on a little bit and make you think. Um, and she said, you know, you can't, you can't not work. Um, and I, my sales were less like this. I was like really flying. It was just a duck to water, really. And uh, slowly, slowly in that six month period, you know, that's what happened. Um, I got to know uh, Devon and his family more. They got to know me. And, you know, for me, I, I'm at home. I, I'm the wife, the daughter-in-law. I can, I can do all of that because that's the culture I was brought up in. Um, and I can also go out. So I, I, I sort of said, you know, I'll, I'll do everything um, if I could be, if I can go to work. And they agreed. So you almost had to get permission. Yes. From your husband and his family yeah. to be able to work. Yes. And, and follow this dream. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. How, how ludicrous does that sound today? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. But you have to ask somebody yeah. whether you can go out and follow this yeah. amazing career. Yeah. Okay. So so you felt that you you got your own way at that time, or was it still a compromise? No, it was thing? fine because obviously then what happened is yes, they agreed. I, I told my employer, um, because I'd done so well. 
um, they actually created a job role for me. Okay. Um, so within six months I was married, um, I got transferred in my job, I carried on my job, but uh, we went on our honeymoon and we had to come back early because within a, f a couple of days my mother-in-law passed away. She literally just stayed alive for the wedding. Mm. So then, um, you imagine I'm 23, I have uh, just moved, a new job, a new home, and I had the responsibility of my father-in-law, my sister-in-law was there, and, and the house I am it now, 23 years old, yeah. and uh, you know, now I really had to learn my rutti baking making skills <laughs> and all of this. But, um, and I did, I used to just ring my mom, how do I do that, how do I do this? I remember it was going on in the background, and you know, that's how you learn, isn't it? If you're in at yeah. the deep end, you, you end up, you can do it. You're, whatever happens, you have to do it. Yeah, yeah. If you're a survivor, and entrepreneurs are, aren't yeah. they? So like you said, you know, jumping yeah. at the deep, deep yeah. end, we'll learn how to yeah. swim, won't we? Yeah. Good. So now you've, you've instantly got another family and you're the woman of the house, yeah. aren't you? Because, you know, mum in law's no longer around. Yeah. So what happens then? So I carried on working and I think, you know, for me, work has given me that sanity. Um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I, I could ever just sit at home and be at home, no. even though family and home are very important. Um, you know, I needed to go out to work. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm quite self-motivated and driven. So, um, carried on working and then I had my first daughter and went on maternity leave. So I'd been working from, for this time now uh, for my employer for sort of a number of years. And uh, whilst I was on maternity leave, there was an, uh, an opportunity that came up and I decided that I wanted to now um, be promoted. And I said, somebody had said to me, you know, why don't you go for that promotion? Okay. And, and I hadn't actually thought about it because I was doing really well at the, the level I was working at. I was always a top salesperson, etc. And then that's why it's important to have mentors who can push you and make you think a little bit differently. And I decided, okay, then I'll do this. And I went on um, for this promotion whilst I was on my interview. Sorry, whilst I was um, on maternity to leave. Um, and I didn't get the job. Okay. And that was just like, oh gosh, that's devastating. And then um, I just finished my maternity leave, went back. And that's when I dawned upon me that, right, okay, um, for that, that was a turning point, not getting that position. I went to other interviews and, and I thought, I'm sitting here and I'd worked for this, my company for eight years now. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could then go and work for somebody else for them to make the decision okay. on if I'm good enough or not. Or to I thought, I'm never going to go and work for anybody else ever again. So in that moment, so how did it make you feel? Because you're a top salesperson. Yeah. Right, not top saleswoman, yeah, yeah. top salesperson. Yeah, but they still deny you promotion. Yeah, what did you think was the cause of that? What do you, why do you think? I, those I, I, I think you know probably people said you know it's always it was your face didn't fit, predetermined. I mean, I didn't even go back for the um, uh, feedback, but I remember they're saying too autocratic, um, you know, too risk taking, etc. Because you have to be a certain mold, don't you? But all yeah. those attributes which were negative, they're all entrepreneurial. They are indeed. So, you know, you know, you're either an entrepreneur or you're a worker. Yeah, but um, large corporations can't take people like us, can yes. they? Because yeah. you're thinking out of the box yeah. and you, you're suggesting things yeah. and it makes people feel uncomfortable, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So in that moment, you decided that you're not going to seek uh, advancement in a career with another yeah. company. Yeah. You're going to set up on your own. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. And so what did you do next? So then um, what um, I did have, in fact, this was my, it was at this, my second daughter. So I'd had my first daughter and I carried on working and this is when I had my okay. second daughter. Um, so um, what I did get from the pharmaceutical industry was great training. And that's where my business idea came from. So I was a medical sales rep and I was um, selling drugs legally, <laughs> seeing doctors. And I was selling a statin, which is for lowering cholesterol. Yeah. And statins were all the big rage in 2000, 2001, because there was a trial, clinical trials that had shown if you've had a heart attack or a stroke, then your cholesterol must be lowered to prevent a further event. Mm -hmm. And what we'd shown in this country, we were quite poor at this. Um, so I used to go to see my doctors and there were guidelines saying, this is what you need to do. And I'd ask, and I'd say to my doctors, like, 
you need to find these patients and then you need to treat these patients and the degree yeah that's fine that's what we will do and I'd go back and I'd say well did you did you treat these pa-? nothing had changed and I okay. thought this is crazy how can I make this happen how can I make this happen so I loved computers always loved computers um, I even my um, final year dissertation was computer based I wrote a, I wrote a program on the BBC computer on catalytic hydrogenation and my university sold it to other universities in the end. <laughs> I'd never be able to do that now, I don't know how I did it then. But um, I loved computers so I self-taught myself the GP systems and again this is breaking the rules. I'd ask my GPs could I find those patients for them on their system and they go yeah it's fine go on. Can you okay. imagine now they go on the system I and I'd go on there and I'd learn it and I'd find these patients. So give me all the patients with a heart attack. I said, right, doctor, these are all your patients. They'd start recalling them in for the clinics. They'd be tested. And then my sales were going through the roof. Wow. And I thought, do you know what? This is a great business opportunity. Because, and then at the time, the government had launched an incentive. Points mean prizes. Mm-hmm. So what happens is doctors got paid on um, the number of targets they'd hit. So yeah. X percent of patients with a heart attack are on a statin. Mm-hmm. Their cholesterol's been lowered. So it's like, it was a, so I thought, okay, I've got a business idea. My company could go and provide clinical audit services where we would identify the patients mm-hmm. who are at risk of heart disease. Um, they, in the process, would get treated with a statin and doctors would benefit because their points mean prizes. That's right. And patients would benefit because they're on the right medicine. Okay. So to win, cut win, win, right? Sorry? Win, win, right? Win, win, win. Yeah. yeah. So, to cut a long story short, I got myself in front of Pfizer, which is the world's biggest company, who had the world's biggest brand with Lipitor. Mm -hmm. And I explained um, how my company, with all my staff, (laughs) who were none at the time, um, would be able to deliver uh, a service for them um, and how it would benefit everyone. And obviously, where, if they are the biggest brand, if you increase the market share, then your brand will naturally increase as well. Of course. Um, and I did manage, before I got in front of the brand manager, do a, a, um, a sort of like a pilot in a local area and they'd seen the benefit. Okay. And again, you know, you'd never get away with anything now like no. this. And, and I did. And I walked out of there with my first contract because they said, that was in July, and they said, what we'd like you to do, we'd like you to deliver 800 practices by December. It was like a half a million pound contract. I thought, oh my God, now, I nearly got to, now I've really got to put it together. I started employing, doing all those things. That's how it started. And we, so at what point did you give up your job? So that I'd already left. You'd left by then? I'd already left. Yeah. Um, I had uh, uh, decided what I was going to do. Okay. Um, so th- this was it. And because I'd been selling a statin, obviously I, I knew people in the industry. I managed to get myself as I said, it was a long story, in front of Pfizer. So let me just take you to maybe it's a side issue, yeah. but it's a big thing for me. So there you are, you're, you've got two children. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing all the cooking and cleaning at home. Yeah, yeah, roti has to be on. Mum said, no matter how successful you are, make sure the roti is on the table. Yeah. And literally that's what I did. I used to make sure the roti, I stop, make sure that everything is done for home and work around the clock. Yeah. So you're really doing two or three jobs, aren't yeah. you? Because people struggle these days, you know. Yeah. Um, you and I both know yeah. that families, a child comes in, yeah. there's about five or six different yeah. people looking after that child. Yeah. So did you have any help at home? No, because it really wasn't seen the thing to do. No. You know, you've got to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. So you've decided now you want to set up your business and did, did you get uh, support from home? What um, did your husband think? Um... It was, it, was, it was fine because obviously I was working yeah. um, and for me, I worked out, uh, because when I first set out, it, I, I had done a little bit of some consultancy training, etc. And I, and I thought, well, if I do about two or three days of that, that pays for my same salary, etc. But then, I, you know, when you've made a choice, failure is not an option. Mm. And I don't think my, my husband and my father really understood what my business was about. But, you know, it was fine. That's what I was going to do. Did that help you that they didn't actually know what you were going to do? I 
suppose in some ways, yeah, because mm. there's no interference there. I'm running my own business and it's down to me to make that work. Yes. Oh, you know, it, it's entirely down to me. Did you get anybody's opinion? You talked about mentors and, and you do mentoring yourself, as, as do I. So, and we realise the value. So was there anybody that uh, was inspiring you or mentoring you at this point? No, not at all. But remember what I said is, it's, uh, you know, I for me... I was always going to be an entrepreneur, wasn't it? It was in my genes. My father was an entrepreneur. It was all, always business in the family. It was all about business. So I was destined to one day set up my business. Okay. And then I came into a family. We were always also running a business. That's right. It's all about business. Yes, yes. So it's in the blood, right? Yeah. So you set up yeah. and do really well? Well, so I uh, set up to start with um, in, in my bedroom. And on, on those early days, I was going out and doing everything. But that's how you learn. I think it's really important that you know every aspect of your business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because, you know, things happen, people let you down, etc. You've still got to be able to pick those up. You can't do everything yourself. So obviously I started employing. But it was a really good lesson yeah. in, in finance, in this and that. And you know what? I, I, I learned the hard way. I wasn't the best um, uh, manager, leader, because as an entrepreneur, you're a control freak. And, and then you learn how to manage people. You learn all of that. Yes. Uh, you know, you don't know all of that to start with. And, and what makes people tick, how to motivate people, how, how to, you know, have staff who, who, who are going to be on their continually working with you with your vision so all of that happened and then um, I, I went from my bedroom um, to buying my first office 5,000 square feet wow uh, so you actually bought not rented no I bought so what happened again is um, you know I was very lucky I, I managed to get into a big corporate company but I think what I realised is to grow, I needed perception, you need a good brand, um, and I needed to employ staff. And my first staff were obviously working from home, but I, I, this is where I needed to expand. So you realise having that corporate background, that must have helped you, yes. that you need to seem yeah. like a proper yeah. corporate, yeah. sizable business yes. to win contracts, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, in Pride Park, buildings were just going up. And um, this was a place to be. So I used to drive around there and went for me, if when I want something, I focus my attention on it and that's, I'm not gonna stop until I've got it. I thought if I'm gonna have an office, it's gonna be here. And uh, there was one plot, it was front facing, it was next door to the Mercedes Benz showroom. Mm -hmm. Obviously Mercedes is so, you know, it's so like, everybody's got a Mercedes, my dad had a Mercedes. So that's where it was, it was gonna be next to the, to the showroom. And um, it was great positioning. And it hadn't even gone up yet. So I rang the agent and he said, um, oh no, sorry, that one's sold. And I continued to ring him. And then one day he rang me to, because it had fallen through. Mm -hmm. So I managed to go from, and, and what I didn't realize actually is, um, you know, I, I didn't take a bank loan or anything like that. It was very profitable and I was actually collecting a lot of cash sure. you don't actually realize because there's nobody to benchmark yourself against is no. there and your your overheads are low you work yeah home. yeah and um I, I had the cash and at that time i managed to get a, a, a mortgage um which i'd never done before and uh just with 10 percent um deposit. deposit yeah and i managed to buy what was a seven hundred thousand pounds uh, office at the time and then it was my father-in-law said you know because I was looking for a smaller one and he said well why don't you get a bigger one you could rent it um the, the top floor and that's yeah. what I did two and a half thousand square feet I rented and downstairs was the office so I managed to get my first office Fantastic. um and then it sort of went from there you know we started working with uh, uh, more companies directly with the NHS I built up a, a national team who would be field-based, who would go into the doctor's practices where we'd be doing the work. Um, and, and then um, I, re I remember I got contacted by the Makers of Secret Millionaire. So I got contacted by the Makers of Secret Millionaire and I remember the first time I was very much into, you know, just making money, making money. And, it, you know, it, it, they came and I said, no, I'm not going to do this. But actually, um, you know, my dad was very, very successful. Nobody remembers him for his wealth, but for what he did for others. Okay. And you know, from a young age, that actually did rub off on me. And you don't realize it until later. 
yeah, all these things. things. Are going on subliminally, aren't they? Yeah. And, and, and they're there, aren't they? Yeah. L- just waiting. So, and, and I remember when I got my first job as a Saturday girl in Richard's shops, every month until I got my job, I would donate £100 to Oxfam. Wow. But, you know, and, and people say to my, about my dad, you know, they said, you know, what a difference he made to our lives. And it was like silly little things. One of my cousins, he'd gone and bought them a video, their first video, or he'd gone and uh, put dishwashers in people's houses or it'd help them a lot. It was all these things. And um, so I was doing all those things. And then when I watched that programme, I thought, you know what, this is a really good programme. And then I went on to a women's trip to Mumbai with a group of women. And it was all about learning about business, etc. And then one day we went to charity. We learned, we went to visit lots of charities. And I was inspired by a woman who'd left the UK, gone over there, and she'd um, set up the National Spastic Society. Was, the name was changed now. Um, and what she did is when she went over there, she had a child who was disabled, a cystic fibrosis. And what she did, um, when she went over there, because the child was disabled, you had no rights to education. So okay. she changed it so that whether you're able or disabled in India, you have a right to education. It took her 35 years. So she changed the law. Changed it. Wow. And then she expanded and did this charity, National. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. All I'm doing is making money. I need to be doing things to be helping others, etc. So when I, I can remember coming back on the plane, I thought, I wish I'd done that program might help me to get into a bit more charitable work or I need to do something different. So you said no initially to that? Yeah. Okay. And then just as I got back, a couple of weeks later, they contacted me again and said, would you do it? And I said, actually, you know what, I will. You were ready. I was ready then. And that's why, you know, if, if you want to be successful, you have to be passionate about whatever you're doing. If you're mm-hmm. passionate, you will be a success. Okay. Don't do it because, oh, it's a new thing to do. So I went and did that program and it was quite life changing, even though it was like a social experiment on TV. Mm. I met people, I met ladies. And for me, I gave to causes, I suppose, who were resonated with me, empowering women. Um, I actually ended up giving money to uh, an organization who um, did lots of building self-esteem for young girls between 16 to 25, when that's quite an important time. So um, I gave money there, and the others was actually a doctor's practice okay. who was setting up um, it was for asylum seekers support and all of this sort of stuff, because those are the things that were sort of important to me. And I carried on working with that charity, and we rolled out programmes in Derby as well in the council. We got some awards for some of the work we were doing. And then I got approached by a global charity to um, head that and chair that their centenary year fundraising Mm -hmm. the target was 10 million and uh, they approached me and um uh, and said would you be our chair this is what we want to do it was a global girls fund you know that comes from girl guiding yeah and it was um and i and i said yes um so i was also then got into more charity work and the target was to raise 10 million in um five years and, and we did it, we, we, and again, it was just like business. Uh, our corporate signature sponsor was UPS. They gave mm-hmm. us $2 million. But, you know, through that, I got to meet royalty. I, I, I had the UPS, uh, I, I, top, I, I met the number one and two from uh, Atlanta. It was, it was just phenomenal through so all that work I was doing. And then at the same time, I got approached by somebody who'd set up a, because this was in the recession now, 2008, 2009. Yeah. So I'd obviously set up my business in 2001. I'd moved office. I'd built up a lot of cash. Um, we had no bank loans, no nothing. You know, it was all self-funding. And um, I then, at that same time as taking on this role, everything, all businesses were going pop. So I got approached by somebody who, unfortunately, they, the the company had gone very grown very fast from zero to seven hundred staff, and uh, the banks were pulling the fund, fund their funding, so they were going to have to close. Okay. So I got approached by them on the Friday to say, would I lend them some money? We got seven hundred staff to pay on Monday, otherwise it could be all over. Right. 
Um, and without any due diligence or anything, I said, okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an equity stake. Wow, great. So <laughs> that was another crazy thing I did. I did that, and on the Monday, I was a co-owner of a security company with 700 staff. Um, on the Monday, everybody loved me. I was a saviour. On the Tuesday, I think I was probably the most hated person. You know. Why was that? Because I was an outsider. Yes. I was an outsider. I didn't know anything about business. Well, I did. Uh, you know, I didn't know the industry. But do you know what? What I did know is I did know a lot about business. Yeah. And actually, I was able to apply all the lessons I learnt into that business uh, and get it where it needed to be. And over, after two years, I, I got all my funds back, what I'd invested, exited. Um, and it was a really, really hard experience. It was a very male chauvinistic um, business. Yeah. It's a completely different industry. Um, but you know what? It doesn't matter. The principles of business are all the same. Always the same, aren't they? Always the same. But what it did teach me was about buying and selling companies. Okay. Um, taught me all of that. It gave me, gave me more lessons. Um, so after, after I, eg- I exited um, my company, and then in 2012, and actually the head office, I'd moved into my um, building that mm-hmm. I had, and then exited. Then I, and it was a recession. It empty floor, and yes. I thought, right, who's going to take two and a half thousand square feet now? What am I going to do? Mm. Because I'd just exited, and now I had so space. They were going to leave. Yeah, yeah, that was that was going that was what was going to happen. They were going to go back to um, their base where they'd started from. I thought, oh gosh, now, what am I going to do now? So I thought, right, I've got this space. Why don't I separate it out? And let me think about my own business experience. I'll create something else. If I make it into smaller businesses, smaller units, I've got more chance of renting it. Now is a recession. You know, there might be startups. And that started my second business, the Oberoi Business Hub. Yes. And um, that's exactly what I did. And within weeks, I was getting people coming because you're spreading your own risk. But people were looking to come without going into long leases into serviced office environment. And we were giving one month, three months, six months or 12 months. But by doing that, we were able to charge a lot more rent because we're doing everything. So that um, and then I thought about what else did I need when I was setting up my own business I needed a brand I needed an address I needed somebody to answer my calls um, so I set up the Oberoi Business Hub so we were doing physical space mm-hmm. um, we started doing call answering on a small scale because I remember I used to go out I used to leave it on the answer machine come back listen to the yeah, messages right. you know it's strange you wouldn't think you'd be doing that now I mean where was my mobile why wasn't I don't know what what you know you think <laughs> what, what was going on um so, and then obviously we were in Pride Park, which yeah. was the place to be. So I thought we could do virtual address and there was space there. And I thought, let's do, turn some of it into conference suites. And then that just, just took off at another level, um, which meant I ended up in the end buying one, two, three, four, five buildings of similar size, seven and a half That's thousand, right. 5,000 square feet. So, you know, it's one challenge then makes you think you're different and then you come out better. Yeah, because uh, as you've got empty space, so you're an entrepreneur, you think, yeah. what can I do with it? Yeah. So out of adversity comes yeah, opportunity. Absolutely. So that was during the last financial crisis, right? Yeah. So I talk a lot about businesses that are set up during yeah. recession. Yeah. So during, you know, not only your business yeah. companies like yeah. Uber, yeah. you know, WhatsApp didn't okay. exist yeah. without that last recession. Yeah. So now we're facing challenging times again, Kavita. Yeah. Yeah. So how deep and how long do you think that the, the economic downturn that we're facing is going I to be? I think uh, we're not going to get back to normality for another two, three years, 22, 23. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, if, for truly entrepreneurial people in business, it's a good time because it pushes you hard and makes you think, I already know some businesses now, you know, their the, the opportunity has come because of the pandemic. Um, and if you go back, you know, Walt Disney was created in the Depression. Yeah. Uh, Hewlett Packard. So, um, so what you've got to do is you've got to ch- change is good. 
you know, everything I've ever done has come as a result of change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about now, what have we done as businesses has changed? So if I talk about my two different businesses, um, Oberoi Consulting, we still work with GP practices and pharmaceutical companies. And actually, we're in September now, and in March, even me, I was thinking, geez, what are we going to do? You know, um, we're not going to, my team aren't going to be able to go to GP practices. Some of the pharmaceutical companies may stop investing in some of the projects. Um, and, and even at the end of last year, we decided that we were going to do things differently mm -hmm. and in terms of scale. Um, how are we going to do it instead of relying around people who are always traveling to practices? And we thought, OK, if we can get a secure N3 connection, which is now called a HSCN, which allows, because you, you've got to pass lots of conformities and of everything, course. it's lots of compliance around it. But if we could pass that, then we could then also use technology to enable us to what we needed to do. So when March, end of March came, that really escalated. Yes. We were already on the journey, we were doing all the compliance and all of that, tick, and then eventually in about June, July, we got it. And now, then doctors started logging on from home to their GP practice, to their databases. And before, they would have been a bit wary. Oh, no, you can't do that. You can't come into our practice. But That's actually, right. now it's a norm. Yeah. So now we just opened up a whole new service provision because we've put that technology in place. But also the world has changed. Yes. And we've just won new contracts because of it, because they're going, oh, you want to lock? Yeah, that's fine. Before, they never would have said that. Tell me something. So I obviously understand being a, a, an entrepreneur myself. So lots of these opportunities have come. But your timing seems impeccable. But I think from experience, you start to get to know what it is that's going to happen. So late last year, I was delivering um, my training in hotels in London. And people were complaining that they couldn't get to the date or they couldn't get to the venue because of geography. You know, people in Scotland were saying, Cam, when are you going to come and yeah. do your events in Manchester yeah. and Wales and all of this? So I thought at the end of the year, I'm going to review all this. So I didn't do an event in November and I planned not to do an event in January. And I sat down and I thought, how can I overcome these two issues that I've got? And I thought, well, geography is easy. You know, deliver it over Zoom. Yeah. So that's, that's great. And then in terms of timing, you know, we could record the thing. So in January, I turned my business totally around from doing events and delivering training live to thinking I will deliver this over, over Zoom. And the 30th of January, we signed up our first client. Yeah. And who would know that, you know, Absolutely. six weeks later, the whole world will be going over Zoom. I mean, and the, the other thing is like with the, the other as part of my business, you know, we do calls for behalf of 300 companies yeah. across the country. And, you know, a few weeks before, I thought, you know what, I, I can just feel something's going to happen. And I'd already always said to our suppliers, can we do this from home? No, we can't. No, we can't. Never, ever take no for an answer. Mm. Sat down with our suppliers, with our phone supplier, with our IT supplier, said, right, we've got to make this happen. We've got to make this happen. And we did. Honestly, if we'd have gone into lockdown the week before, we might have been in trouble. But I managed to move everybody to home working because I needed the same staff to provide the same quality service. Yes. And um, so they started taking their calls from home when we were in lockdown. So it never affected the companies. But then the next challenge was com some companies started cancelling yes. because they, they couldn't physically operate. For example, physios, property practices, they were shut. Yes. So we'd made all this investment and now we were losing business. And again, people think, oh my God, right, we're not going to invest. You know what? Always invest in your business, especially at a time of a crisis. So I said to the team, right, half of you are going to work on lead generation. Mm -hmm. Half of you are going to support the clients that are coming in because obviously we'd had less calls. Yes. Because clients had cancelled. And half of you are going to work on new opportunities. Let's think about all the industries Perhaps when it's normal times, we're taking lots of calls. We did that. We started with lawyers, actually. We got them hunting. They started sending emails. They started doing outbound calls. And post-lockdown, those clients, we got new contracts. And for us now, for them now, it's a norm. Yes. Because their staff, they still can't have them on the premises. They can't have the receptionists on the premises. So we've come out better, stronger. Oh, now 
we've recruited more staff and we're yes. looking for more staff. Yes. So challenge is what drives entrepreneurs. Yes, and the thing that I've picked up um, is that you don't take no for an answer. Absolutely do you? no. So how does it feel? Because I get the same challenges, obviously, is that you've got these so-called experts telling you, Cam, this can't be done. And you're saying, but why not? Yeah. And do you feel that that's, because I always think that I go back to when I was 14, 15 years old, because as a child, nothing's impossible. Yeah. You just can't, you can't understand why yeah. somebody can't afford something. Yeah. Why can't this can be done? Is that the same for you? Do you go back and think, why? For me, I think I'm just really, self, uh, really motivated and self-driven. And, and for me, it's not no, it's how. Mm -hmm. It's how we're going to do something. An entrepreneur often will go and do it first, they've sold it, got no idea how they're going to do it and work backwards. Yes. I've always sold everything. It's in my head. I'm like here, everybody else is here, and then they're playing catch up. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's how I am. That's how I'm built. So if I was sitting, um, watching this now, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about starting my business. Yeah. Obviously very fearful, some yeah. people, and um, they want to know the whole process. But what you seem to be saying, and I agree with you, by the way, is that you don't need to know it all. Work it out as you go I never along. had a business plan. No. I never wrote a business plan. No. I'm terrible. I, I don't think I could write a business plan. Yeah. But what I'm good at is I've got a vision, I've got a passion, and the other thing is people. People by people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to be very credible in what you're doing. You've got to deliver, you know, and you've got to treat every client as if it's your own business. Yeah. And that's what I instill in all my people. You know, whatever service we're doing, it's like it's, you drive it like it's your own business. We really care, be passionate about that. And, and success will come. I've never worked for money. Money is a byproduct of success. So, you know, if you're passionate about what you're doing and you've got belief in that, then it'll be successful. Yeah, and the money will come, won't Money it? will come, yeah. yeah. Yeah? And that's the other thing, isn't it? When, you, when you're younger and you're hungry, yeah. Yeah. perhaps you've got money much further up yeah. the list. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Tony Robbins talks about it. I think he puts money at something like six or seven. Yeah. And he said, I would put it lower yeah. even than that. Yeah. So you, that, that's the advice that you'd give? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And so if you provide value, yeah. You know, Zig Ziglar talks about yeah. it. So if you help enough people get what they yeah. want, yeah. you'll get what Absolutely. you want, Absolutely, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. And always help, you know, uh, if you can help. But, you know, I do, I do a lot of uh, charity work. I'm just setting up a foundation now as well. I want to try and give back as much as I can. If you do good, you'll get good. Yes. So you've been doing quite a lot of charity work during uh, lockdown. Yeah, you? So yeah. So tell us about it. So obviously um, I did a lot of global work before and then I started doing a lot of work locally because I sit on the local council board. Mm -hmm. And uh, about five, six, seven years ago, uh, somebody said that, you know, we've got children in our city going to school hungry. And I yeah. went, no way. I said, how can that be? And then I looked and I worked with the council and they really were. And I said, let's do something about it. And I used to have meeting after meeting, took a few years, and I said, look, forget it, let me just pilot, I'll fund a few schools, let's see the impact. And that's what I did. Mm. We, we, um, we managed to work with a charity who works with um, surplus. So, like, if something's out of date or something's counterfeit, they have lots of surplus. Yeah. And then they try and put it to good use. Mm -hmm. And through working with them, we managed to get the cost of a cereals down to £15 for a year for one child wow. and they would do all the distribution so um, I managed to get the food from at a low cost and then um, we worked with Derby County Community Trust who's a charity to be our custodians for our money because I didn't want to then get into setting up a formal sure. charity for that and then um, I thought right who can pay for this business you know the children are the future of business and, and you know we've got low educational attainment levels here um, food is part of the mix you think about if you're hungry in the morning you can't concentrate so it could contribute to that and that's just grown we're in 17 schools now and uh, during lockdown Marcus Rushford did a campaign so uh, you know on the back of that we reinvited they invigorated that campaign but I had people nationally give money to that so now you know we're going again now in September and uh, there's children back at school and we've got money there now to sustain some of those clubs fantastic so the charitable work's getting bigger. Yeah, yeah. You're doing more and yeah, more of that. Yeah. Okay. So tell me now, you know, you're one of those very, very few individuals that's been given an OBE. Yes. 
So how did that come about and how did it feel? Well, um, I mean, it was amazing when you get the letter. It's like, oh my God, what's this? The cabinet office, the brown letter. And it's like, wow. Um, and I didn't actually understand what it meant. I had to go and show my PA at the time. And <laughs> she said this and, and I, I was just, um, it was unbelievable. So I got my OBE for uh, services to charity, uh, services to um, entrepreneurship and business. Um, and again, um, I, I'd done a lot, a lot of charitable work. I'd set up a scheme um, with a college. I was at Burton College where I was a patron. And that was about getting learners into work whilst they were studying. Um, and I took on a, a few of the uh, students from there, my own business. Um, and the idea was that you know, if you've got the experience, then it's more likely you're going to get a job. And through that scheme, we got about 100 children into work, into different companies. Um, so I was doing a lot of charity work around that. So I, it's, and then I set up the business hub. So it all sort of came from all the sort of work that I was doing. Uh, it was a surprise and a great honour. Fantastic. Um, how do people around you react uh, to you receiving that award? Friends, family and business Yeah, people? I think everybody was uh, really proud. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. So no naysayers? Sorry? No naysayers? Um, not that, well, the, not to myself, <laughs> maybe, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So tell me then, so you've done all of that. So how's, how's a family life evolved yeah. from the Kavita that used to make roti for everybody? Yeah. And as well as running her business? It's still the same Kavita that makes roti for everybody. Yeah. Six o'clock, my father needs his roti on the table and that's still there. Fantastic. So those things haven't changed No, at all. things haven't changed. But do you still need permission to do things? Um, probably less permission now. Okay. A little bit of permission, but not as much. Okay. So what are your hopes for the future? What happens now? Um, I think obviously now it's about the next generation. Um, my own daughter is going to be getting married in a couple of years. You know, it's about the, the children and, you know, and, and I can already see some of the lessons and the things I've done. I can see that naturally in some of the traits and some of the things that they're doing. So it, it's about that, it, you know, it's about the family, you know, family is key. Um, and yeah, you know, and uh, as an entrepreneur, you're not going to slow down. There's, there's probably going to be other new opportunities, perhaps when we talk in a few more years. Yeah. Do you ever talk about the retirement word? Oh, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's incredible. Yeah. I. I sold, as we were talking before the show, I sold my uh, trading business in 2018. Um, and I thought about retiring for about three, three or four days. And I thought, good God, how on earth mm -hmm. can I ever do that? Yeah. I've got a solicitor's practice uh, outside my old, old, old office. I really admired them. They're, they're an African family that came across um, in 1972. So I'm still dear friends with, with the son. But the father was uh, uh, coming to the office and he would ring up occasionally, you know, but uh, come and have a cup of tea. And I think he was 88 or 89 uh, when he passed. And he said, if I don't come to the office, yeah. I feel ill. That's right. You know, and, and he'd drive in for a couple of hours. Yeah. And he'd probably call somebody like yeah. me every day. Yeah. But he still felt the, the need to come, right? Absolutely. So one of the things that I always say, and you ask me again, you know, what do you do, um, little as possible. Has it, does it ever feel like it, that you're working? You know what they say, um, if you're doing what you love, you don't ever feel like you're working. Um, I do feel like I'm working. I mm -hmm. work really, really hard. Yeah. Um, you know, people say, well, you're, you know, luck, you make your own luck. Mm -hmm. The harder you work, the luckier you'll become. Yes. And, you know, don't think that successful people are just successful. They work very, very hard. They do indeed. But they sometimes make it look easy, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. To the outside world, they may feel like it's easy. Oh, they've done that now, that, they've done that now, mm. but they're actually working very hard. Yeah, behind the scenes. Right? Behind the scenes. Okay, so a couple of things now. Um, you know, our programme's all about inspiring yeah. the youngsters, and you've obviously done lots of that throughout your life. What advice would you give uh, to your 20-year-old self that's sitting there today? I think, um, I think obviously, um, you know, don't let anybody else set out your destiny mm -hmm. you are responsible for your destiny believe in yourself um compromise i think it's really important to compromise and don't lose that focus mm -hmm. you've got to be really focused on that end goal 
Um, and, uh, I, I, and, you know, again, I think you have to also think about your environment because if you've got a happy and content environment, then you can do what you want to do. That's what I had to do. If I didn't do the things I needed to do at home, then I wouldn't have been able to, able to work. So you have to have a little bit of compassion and empathy, um, but don't forget the you and yourself. Um, and sometimes you have to be a little bit selfish as well, so otherwise you do get, you know, taken advantage of. So, you know, that, that is important. Um, and over the last few years, you know, uh, you know, I've travelled so much more, taken holidays, taken out some of that time. Um, but, yeah. Okay. Um, how much better or worse has the fact that you're a female been throughout your career? Um, I don't see myself as like I'm a female. I just feel, feel myself as, a, you know, I never think, oh, I'm a woman, I'm disadvantaged. You know, I, I, I don't see that. And no, I some, some that. No, no, see that. no yeah. so because some people go, oh, like I'm a woman, so I, this is this, or I'm going to be this. I, I, I don't, I think it's the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. You know, and I employ a lot of women, um, not bec but I employ them because they're the best people for the job. Or if I've seen somebody who's a different gender, I I'm looking at the best person for the job. Okay. Do you think, I mean, um, and in, I don't ever feel that anybody's discriminated against me. If they've mm. not given me mm. something, so be it. Do you think people today, um, you know, want to play the victim card too easily? Yeah, I, I think so. I think if you haven't got something or haven't won something, you need to look at why. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of, of uh, it, you know, there'll be some reason there as to why. And you think you need to just step back a little bit instead of thinking, well, X, Y and Z, or it's because I'm a woman, or it's because of my ethnicity, etc. So for, for you, that doesn't exist? Well, if it does, I don't, I don't use that as a reason for failure. I, I uh, you know, I, I probably look at, you know, why, why didn't we get there? Why didn't we win it? Yeah. You know, do an analysis. Yeah. I mean, there's reasons, aren't yeah. there? There is discrimination. Yeah. We can't deny yeah. that. And it exists. And I'm sure both you and I yeah. have been victims of that yeah. at some point. Uh, but we don't carry it no. like a, a, yeah. a, a, a badge of honour. No. That say, look yeah. at me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that, you know, are, are people made of softer stuff these days that, they won't take rejection, that they want to run and look at these kind of excuses? I think so, I think so. And I think what you've got, if you're an entrepreneur, you're very resilient. Mm -hmm. So you need resilience. So, you know, whatever you're doing, because you're going to get a lot of knockbacks. It's, it's, it's like this, entrepreneurship is like this. It's not like that. No, not at all. Okay, so we've got, as you and I both agree, and I think the whole country's waking up to the fact that we're going to feel, uh, be in an almighty recession. So again, if I was an existing business or if I was thinking about setting up, what advice would you give to me? I think what you've got to do is think outside the box. You've got to change the way perhaps you're delivering a business. And we've seen lots of businesses perhaps who were doing alcohol, they started making gel. So there are going to be opportunities, mm -hmm. but you might have to think about how you, if it's the same business, how you're going to be redeploy that business. So you've got to, that's what you've got to do. And I think you've got to look for the newer opportunities. And as I said, change is good. It, businesses that don't change fail anyway. Recession or re no recession. No, no. So if you're willing to change? Yeah, if you're you, willing you're to. You're not going to fail. It's the you? survival of the fittest. Darwin's yeah. theory, isn't it? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, those that adapt the best. Yeah. Right, that's where it goes. Can we say, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your mm -hmm. story. And I'm sure that we, there'll be many, many questions that come from the audience. Um, how do people contact you? Because you work with young people and I'm sure that you, you know, one of your charitable organisations could help people. How do people contact you? Um, so uh, you can follow me on social media. So on Instagram, um, at Kavita Oberoi, uh, Twitter, um, LinkedIn. And uh, obviously I've got my websites out there, which I've got contact forms on, kaviteroberoi.com. So those are all the places to contact me. Yeah, you're very visible, aren't you? Yeah. So you guys, there's no excuses for, for not being able to find this lady if you want some help and advice. Because the, the first thing that I did in reaching out was send you a message on LinkedIn, didn't I? You did, yes. Right? Even though I knew you. Yes. And as a business person, you want to be approached properly, don't you? Absolutely, yes. It's very important. The approach is important. And, 
you know, I, I get lots of people writing letters, sob stories, etc. Uh, you know, and uh, that those can be piles and piles of letters. Uh, you know, and I do uh, reach out to different people, and I have, but it's been a, because of their approach. But look, we've come to the end of our time, so hopefully we'll do this again at some point. Yeah. So I want a big, big thank you. Thank you for having us in your home. Yeah, no so problem. Appreciate that. So it's a Saturday that we're recording this, so yes. giving up some uh, family time for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. So guys, you know, it's come to the end of our time again. An absolutely wonderful, inspiring story. There's no excuses, you know. Uh, Kavistro O'Brien um, looks like a very gentle, uh, very debutal kind of lady, but believe me, there's a heart beating in there of steel. She will never take no for an answer. And resilience came out today. And when people say no to you, it's not no forever. You know, when the building that she is actually in and most of that business park that's now owned by her company, uh, originally the agent said, sorry, it's sold. But, you know, she refused to take no for an answer. So build up your resili resili resilience. We've got some hard, hard times to come. So until next time, thank you for watching.